So let's look at a few more points about uh, food and climate. So now that we are uh, convinced that we came out of the Holocene into the Anthropocene and we have been warming the climate and increasing the extremes as we saw before. Food production has gone up, uh, deforestation, land conversion is combined for agriculture, is combined with urbanization as well, which produce other uh, problems in terms of uh, runoff, coastal water pollutions, harmful algal blooms, pathogens, and so on, urban heat island effects, and of course inequalities, poverty, etc. But food production itself now is a significant contributor to uh, emissions which are uh, responsible for the climate change in the first place. So this says food emissions could consume most of our 1.5 degree C or 2 degree C carbon budget. So to uh, remain uh, to keep global warming from exceeding 1.5 degrees C or 2 degrees C with respect to the industrial uh, revolution, uh, we are constrained in terms of how much additional carbon we can put into the atmosphere. Carbon is inert, it stays in the atmosphere for a long time and keeps accumulating. So we can, and there is a, a near linear relation between accumulated CO2 in the atmosphere and the warming, which allows us to estimate how much more CO2 we can emit uh, if we want to constrain the temperature rise to these with some probability like 66 percent. Of course it depends on choices on population, renewable energy, technologies, carbon capture and sequestration and so on. Nonetheless, given the way we produce food, uh, if we continue business as usual, that's how much uh, CO2 we would emit between 2020 and 2100. So 13 156 billion tons uh, of uh, carbon for 1.5 degree C budget uh, with a 67% probability of hitting this target. Uh, we need we need uh, to emit we should emit only 500 gigaton. So even if we uh, s stop all emissions from uh, non-food sectors, for example energy and industry today, food emissions alone would take us uh, well beyond 1.5 degrees centigrade. With the fi lower chance of hitting 1.5 degrees C, we can of course emit more carbon, but still uh, that's not a good idea. For 2 degrees C budget, uh, global warming target, we have bigger room for emitting more carbon, uh, especially if we reduce the probability. But the point is, if climate change and food are interacting very closely, food production, crop yields and so on, and human health is closely related to that as well as population, then obviously we cannot worry about each thing separately. We have to worry about it together. Often though are, those are referred to as nexus, for example, between water, energy and food, but we also have to add health and worry about water, energy, food and health. So projections are made. This is historical 1971 to 2000 heat wave days here, looking at the legend here. Uh, and for um, comparing uh, the one of the scenarios called uh, representative concentration pathway 8.5. I won't go into the details, but you can um, look at these in my other podcasts in the other courses but essentially those are scenarios for the future where we assume several socioeconomic pathways and see where emissions will get us and uh, 2071 to 2100 with that business as usual scenario you can see that most of the global south or the tropics will have incredible increase in heat wave days compared to these um, historical periods not a good idea at all, right? So these are already vulnerable to climate change and they will just continue to be more vulnerable. This raises all sorts of issues about who emits most of the carbon and who's responsible for climate change and so on as well. Population, uh, I won't go into these. As I said, these projections can have uncertainties, but the uh, projections did use these population projections in estimating emissions and so on, so we should keep that in mind. But you can see that China and India here show up, uh, of course, and Africa as well in terms of population increases. The exposure to uh, heat wave would increase tremendously over here as well, which depends on various socioeconomic factors, especially uh, 
urbanization and growth of population in the urban areas would produce lots of increased exposures. Um, along with those come the conflicts as we talked about before Syria, the drought and the persistence of the droughts, Arab Spring and the war that continues is a good example of how uh, conflict and climate as a force multiplier are also uh, tied together. They have direct health outcomes for child, mother and uh, the whole family of course in terms of nutrition that we are talking about, violence, mental health, serious problem, infectious diseases and wars tend to cause redirection of resources to war, infrastructure of society, damage to the social fabric fabric of society, displacement of population as is happening with the Rohingyas, uh, with the refugees from uh, Syria and uh, so on, depletion uh, or contamination of natural resources including air and water, fostering a culture of violence because many populations if they feel hopeless they might feel that joining the conflict will uh, increase their chances of benefiting from it, okay, maybe by ending up on the winner's side. Uh, this is an article from The Lancet which talks about the impact of conflicts on uh, women and children. So this is change in mortality rate in Asia, Africa, uh, uh, Americas and combined. It's also looking at increased uh, increases from uh, observed rates, so how much mortality uh, increases. Obviously as the conflict, conflict deaths increase in each case, in each of the regions and the combined, the uh, change in mortality rate increases as well and of course uh, women and children pay a disproportionately high price often that is associated with severe health outcomes. So now again I'm saying conflict and climate cannot be separated, availability of food cannot be separated from those two including violence and migration or forced uh, displacements and so on and that also has uh, health uh, outcomes. Uh, what is vulnerability then? It's basically exposure to weather event combined to sensitivity to extreme weather event, could be genetic, could be regional, could be um, some uh, intrinsic uh, sensitivity. The event impact then uh, is related to how quickly the uh, community or society is able to adapt and how resilient it is to these uh, sorts of um, impacts and that determines the net health vulnerability. Okay, It's the product of these three but the adaptation and resilience themselves depend on so-called adaptive capacity or coping capacity. So adaptation has steps where you ba basically cope with what's coming at you so you try to uh, manage the unavoidable uh, or you adjust to the unavoid, uh, unmanageable or you transform. So there is the vulnerability which context it can be social, political, economic, institutional processes and changes with outcomes in sensitivity, exposure, impacts and hazards. Uh, and resilience could be transformative, adaptive and absorptive. Uh, we won't go into the details but you get the idea that for example absorptive resilience can be able to drive regeneration, recovery and stability whereas transformative is learning and changing and preparing to reduce, uh, increase resilience and reduce vulnerability into the future. So coping capacity and adaptive capacity include diversity, institutions, resources and productivity and the questions then come to uh, how do we uh, hold people accountable? For example, now plastics, which are a used to be a miracle substance, but now so much is used uh, in all countries, especially in uh, the developed world, and they are discarded rather carelessly. And this is showing the uh, global plastic carbon cycle uh, about around about 2015, and it's everywhere: soils, air. Uh, ocean deposited along coasts, even in the deep ocean, in fish, in uh, food products, uh, even the, the tea bags that you dip is probably releasing nanoparticles of plastic and it's in human bodies as well. Okay, so what is the impact on health? We don't know yet. 
and is there possibility of global action to deal with not so obvious either but vulnerability is also a little bit more complicated now in addition to all these nexus between climate conflict food water energy health and so on um, increased uh, probabilities of extreme events this is an example of typhoon Haiyan which hit uh, Philippines in 2011 I think and it had uh, one of the strongest intensities and largest sizes of typhoons at the time and there was no doubt that global warming had contributed to making it more intense than in a counterfactual natural world where global warming was not happening uh, so the question was what who will pay for the additional damage suffered by the Philippines because of this uh, global warming impact on its intensity and size plus look at the impact direct impact Philippines exports uh, such as uh, Philippine exports such as coconut oil have fallen uh, after typhoon Haiyan that affects all these countries including six percent of all US production relies on supplies from the Philippines but even the developing world like parts of Africa are affected there are no data in some places but they were affected by dependence on Philippines uh, uh, imports secondary impacts now it's much more obvious all these developing world that were hit by the impact of typhoon Haiyan because of the global supply chain global economies global dependence on exports and imports 21 percent of US production could suffer indirectly from supply chain problems related to uh, typhoon Haiyan which is cyclones are natural so the question is are they rapidly intensifying are their um, sizes and intensity intensification rates are changing uh, tracks are changing damage is increased disruption of the supply chains is uh, increased and so on and of course there are direct health impacts associated with each of these cyclones because of the floods and storm surge and inundation you have incredible number of uh, waterborne diseases as well right so this is what we are facing now we are it's not just a simple matter of saying climate and health it is these cascading effect what are now called compound events where you have sea level rise intensification of cyclones so increased storms storm surge and inundation increased coastal uh, populations coastal urban populations as well inundation of soils and salinification drop in food production nutrition food availability and health so you can imagine how many factors are being compounded now so these are the things we have to worry about okay